Hey family, Pastor Ben Warwick here, and I'm super excited to have you joining with us today. I know the Lord's put a word on my heart, and I hope that it ministers to you right where you are. In fact, I want you to take a moment and take this link, share it with your friends, let them know this word is coming, and I want you to hang in there until the very end, because I'm gonna come back and pray over your needs. So let's jump into this word and be blessed. Who's excited to talk about obedience? Like five people. Awesome. Well, that's a word that no one loves to hear. And uh, I pray that this message somehow puts it in a different light for you. That the Lord, that the Lord removes maybe the lens and, and this jacked up filter that the world's put on you about obedience unto the Lord and, and what that means for a believer. And so here's what I want to do. I want to pray for you. That the Lord would open your ears and your heart to his word. And I want you to pray for me. Uh, that I would preach exactly what the Lord wanted me to. So, is that good? Yeah. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for those under the sound of my voice. I pray you would open our ears, our minds, and our hearts to your word. I pray that you'd strengthen us and uh, just keep us bound to the plan that you have for our life, Lord. I believe somebody's getting free today. I believe somebody's picking up the path that they stepped away from. Lord, I believe somebody's picking up the calling they put down. I believe somebody's getting over a mistake today because of your grace and your mercy. In Jesus' name we pray. Come on, and all God's people said? Amen, amen. amen. There, uh, there was a period in my life where I struggled to obey the rules in my household. Now, I would tell you it's a period. My dad would tell you it was 21 years, right? And, um, but I felt like there was a season in my life where like, it didn't matter what the rule was. I was just kind of going to do whatever I wanted to do, and uh, I did grow up, and I've shared this before, I kind of grew up in, in a pretty strict church, uh, what some would probably call legalistic, and while there were certainly things that, uh, you know, were man and not the Lord, there was a whole lot that that church taught me about uh, just trusting the Lord and being obedient to Him. And the older I get, the more I realize that some of the people that might have steered me the wrong way, they were not doing it out of uh, a mean heart, they were just doing it out of maybe a little ignorance, but... Uh, I found out something in my early life in church, and it came to fruition in my ministry now, is that obedience matters to the Lord. It matters a lot to the Lord. Uh, and let me give you a few reasons why, okay? Here's some few, few reasons why obedience matters to the Lord, okay? And if you're new to our church, this is a note-taking culture, and so if you look in the seat back pocket in front of you, there's a note card. Feel free to write on that, take it home, and, you know, do whatever with it. And uh, why does obedience matter to the Lord? I think, first of all, it's honoring it's honoring, okay? It's honoring to the Lord when you obey him because he's Lord, he's not liaison, all right? And I just want you to know, I like, I came ready, Donnie. I came ready to preach today. I came ready to maybe rip a few band-aids today because I'm not in war with you, but I am at war with the enemy that's trying to twist the word of God in your mind and in your life. But I believe that when you honor the Lord, right, like that, that, that's, that, that matters. Obedience is a part of honoring the Lord. There's this weight that's attached to the Lord and what he says to do because he's king of kings and Lord of lords. I think another reason why obedience matters to God is that it's how we make it to the end of this faith race, okay? It's how we make it to the end of this journey. I love what Eugene Peterson says. He's, he's the author of the Message Bible and uh, he says, spiritual success in, is long-term obedience in the same direction. It's learning to obey God without boredom, okay? And we've put such a weight on the word obedience that when you attach it to the name of the Lord, it's like there's this boredom that comes with it. But I, I learned that the Lord will ask you to do some buck wild things, like wild things, like some wild stuff that you never saw coming. And if you jump after it, you're like, okay, so maybe this isn't a boring trip, right? And uh, I, I learned something about culture today too. You got to be bold in today's culture. And let me tell you something. If, if you're a believer, I, I'm done with the whole passiveness. Like I, we've been quiet long enough. Okay. If somebody's, they're going to get offended by a mustache, no mustache, beard, no beard, gray hair, white hair, tall, skinny, short, fat, whatever. People are going to be offended by you, whatever you do. So why not just be you? <laughs> why not just live your faith out? Why not just be you, and why not just, uh, just live for the Lord with great boldness, you know? And one of my favorite people in all of Scripture is, is Joshua. Man, he's just such a brave warrior. Joshua's a bad dude when you study up on Joshua. And I want you to turn with me to Joshua 24, okay? 
Joshua 24, while you're turning there, I'm going to share with you a little bit of what's going on. He takes, it's kind of towards the end of, of, of the book of Joshua, and he's kind of wrapping up uh, all the things that God did for them. And he starts with Abraham, and uh, he goes all the way down through every single enemy that tried to crush them, destroy them, and ruin them, okay? And in each one of those situations, he talked about how God delivered them and God saved them. And then he gets to the end and he says, and it's the Lord who has given you this promised land with vineyards you didn't plant, right? Cities that you didn't build. And uh, look at what he says in verse 14 through 15. He says, now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him with sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods of your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if, the evil in your, and if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your fathers served in the region beyond the river, the gods of the Amorites in whose land that you dwell. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord, right? He, he goes down this long list and, and, and he says, God's been there time and time again for me. I've watched him destroy whole cities and people groups. I watched them part the Red Sea. I watched them part the Jordan River. You do what you want to do, but I'm going to serve the Lord. Like you could risk, risk it for your biscuit, but this household's staying with the king, right? And uh, if you want to make it to the end of this journey, man, it comes down to obeying and making the right decisions. It comes down to obeying the Lord, making the right decisions, choosing to obey him. Listen, even when people don't, even when those around you stray, you've got to stay committed to God and committed to his word. Joshua was saying that to the people. And here's something that we forget easily is that obedience, hear me, it it keeps you from harm. Obedience keeps you from harm. They're the guardrails, like the the rules. um, Look at the laws today. Like laws are getting a bad rap now because a bunch of kids that don't have a job on a college campus somewhere. And, but laws are not, laws are not bad. Okay. They're guardrails. Okay. They keep you from doing things that will harm you or harm somebody else, okay? And even in your own house, you have rules, right? You've got rules, and, and, and we had a little bit, we had a mouse the other day, okay? So we had a mouse, wife freaked out, right? Ladies, y'all, yeah, how many of y'all, like, you would freak out if you saw a mouse in your house, right? I grew up in the country, wife grew up in the city, two totally different people. I'm like, that's just a field mouse, you know what I mean? So we did the thing, we got some traps, right? And I set up a trap. Now, Raleigh, one of my twins, who we call Beans, she is super curious and doesn't listen to anything. And so I set the mousetrap, and I heard that thing go off. She was sticking toys in that mousetrap, setting it off. <laughs> and I set it up, and I said, baby, don't put your finger in there, right? And I turned her, I stepped back, because I was like, I'm about to watch this right here. And lo and behold, she does this number, look. And she goes to reach down. Now, I had a choice in that moment, okay? Like, I could have been like, you know what, I'm going to let you touch it, Right? <laughs> And break her little finger, or I could have been like, no. And so like, part of me was like, yeah, go ahead on, touch it, try it. That's what I wanted to do, but I was like, no, I stopped her, right? Because a good dad would not let their daughter break their finger in a giant rat trap, right? Because I made the rule to protect her. I said, hey, don't touch the trap, it's going to hurt you. And yet, when the Lord tells us, hey, don't touch that, that sin is going to hurt you, we're like, As if God, we stick our hand in the trap of sin as if God's withholding something from us. He's not holding something from you. He's keeping you from you. God shut the door to keep you from walking in a room you didn't belong in. Like God's trying to keep us from, and he he puts these parameters in our life, and he puts these rules in our life not to keep us from something, but to bless us with something else. And I know this, a life without parameters, a life without instruction, it's a life that honestly leads to destruction, okay? Okay. There's no good ending. There's no good ending to it. But there is a benefit attached to obeying the Lord. In fact, Psalms 37, 4 says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Now, I grew up in church, right? I've heard this verse before. And man, we've been in the altar. I've been praying, Lord, give me the desires of my heart. But did you know that that is the second half of that verse? That there's a first half to the verse. In fact, the prerequisite for the Lord Giving you the desires of your heart is for you to delight yourself in him, to serve him, to love him, to be committed to him, to have this like, like 
obedience and trust and love for him. And when you have that, this heart change begins to take place in your heart. And your heart, which is over here, and his heart that's over here begins to be in line and walk in step. And that's why God can give you the desires of your heart, because your heart is not desiring anything outside of him. You're desiring a marriage that's founded in him, right? You're desiring uh, uh, friendships like Jesus had with his disciples. He knows that if you just get your heart aligned with him, man, man, your desires, they'll all line up right as well. And I, I found this about the Lord. When you give your heart to him, things change, right? You don't go where you used to go, right? You don't sleep around with who you used to sleep around with, right? I told you I'm, I'm ready to go to that. Uh, like, you don't say some of the words you used to say, right? You don't drink some of the things you used to drink because there's this definitive change because no longer are you trying to fulfill the desires of your own heart, you're trying to fulfill the desires of the heart of the Lord. And man, there's such favor in that. And I know that sounds like holiness preaching, but that also sounds like the truth to me, Donnie, so I'm not really sure. Whatever, thank you. Like there's this tension, y'all. There's a tension in the church world and as a pastor I see it. Here's the tension. A lot of people come to church for this reason. They feel like when they come to church, they're paying a penance for all the stuff they did wrong all week, all right? It's like you get up Sunday morning and you're like, ah. you're weighing it, right? Like you're, you're definitely not coming to the early service. You're weighing it, right? You're, you're thinking like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come to one of them. You know, and you think about your week and you're like, well, last week I flipped two people off on 285. I uh, stumped my toe and I said a bad word real loud and the kids heard it. Uh, me and my wife got in an argument about a thermostat. You know what? I think I should probably go to church today, right? It's like we go to church to get like scrubbed clean from all that we did wrong. And, and if that's you today and you're here, I appreciate your effort and wanting to be here. But we got to get culture past this whole thing that going to church is some time, kind of gold attendant star of penance that just wipes it free. No, we should enter into his gates with thanksgiving. We should desire to want to be around other believers and to worship and magnify the Lord. And that's what's enriching and that's what's fulfilling to us. And while I appreciate it, man, I just hope that you're in here today. You can get past that whole church is a duty thing and understand that obeying the Lord and, and, and not forsaking the fellowship of believers is how you strengthen your walk. Because how many, let's just be real, how many more times are we going to come into church, lift our hands and worship, but walk out with an unchanged heart? Like how many more trips, how much more time do we want to waste? Like if you want to get on my last nerve, be late. Man, I can't, I can't be late. I can't waste time. Time is my biggest thing. I got to be on time. Now I'm married and I got kids, so yes, we are late periodically, Right? often many times but like like i just time matters so much it matters so much to me so why would you want to waste time just coming in and, and getting attendance star and walking back out why wouldn't you want to meet the lord here why wouldn't you want to give him all the things that you struggled with all week and let him take them from you let me give you an example of like good intentions in worship but that didn't really go well okay let me talk about somebody in, in scripture saul god help him First king of Israel, tries to be good, can't find his way out of a paper bag, and he finally disobeys the Lord so much that the Lord is just done with him, okay? And he fails to take the city the right way and destroy everything, so he thinks, well, I, I disobeyed the Lord, so let me just offer a big sacrifice, God will be appeased if I just, it's like people who are like, well, I had a bad week, let me just give God an extra 20 in the offering plate, right? And what does Samuel the high priest say in, in 1 Samuel 15, verse 22, he says, but Samuel replied, what is more pleasing to the Lord? Your burnt offerings and sacrifices or your obedience to his voice, okay? Listen, your obedience is better than sacrifice. And submission is better than offering the fat of rams. Y'all, good intentions are not enough. God wants your heart. He wants your heart. And if he has your heart, let me tell you something. Obedience will be a natural byproduct of the Lord caring for your heart and loving your heart. Right? My, my wife and I, we've been married. We're about to be 12 years coming up in June. And if my wife comes to me, I know that she loves me with her whole heart. Like we have a connection, right? And so if she comes to me and says, hey, I'm stressed out. I need you to vacuum the house. Well, I'm going to vacuum the house. Not because I got told to, but because, man, I know that's a burden on her. And she's the other half of my heart. And why would I want the other half of my heart suffering? Why not just make it work together, right? And so when you're in love with the Lord and he asks you to do something that other people wouldn't do, you do it willingly. Why? Because you just want to please him. You just want to please him. 
Time and time again, I think the word shows us that the byproduct of a life devoted to the Lord is favor. It's favor and blessing. That's why obedience matters because, man, a lot of people are like, man, I just, I wish I had favor like you. Well, I'm not sure, like, have you looked at maybe what you're saying yes to and what you're not to with the Lord? Right. Faith, I found this out. I want you to write it down. Faith leads to obedience and obedience leads to abundance. Like your faith, it, it, you develop this faith of the Lord and you go, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give up a few things and I'm going to chase after the things of God, right? Which, by the way, doesn't mean ministry all the time. Like sometimes you just need to be really good Christian at your job. You need to be a really good Christian nurse, you know? And when your faith, man, it leads to obedience, then that obedience, the Lord blesses it and it leads to abundance. He puts his favor on those who are connected to him to keep his, and keep his will. And I've had conversations with people, and maybe you're one of them today, that's like, I don't know, Pastor, like, I've had some close people in my life promise me something but not deliver. And you're telling me if I obey the Lord, then he promises to bless me, and he promises to keep me, and he promises to put his hand on what I'm doing. But I just got tension there because you just don't know my mom didn't show up, or my my dad messed up, or my my ex-husband didn't do this and didn't do that. But we've got to stop holding God accountable for the disappointments that others have caused in our life. Like, you got to stop. It's not, he didn't do it, okay? Another human did because they're full of sin like the rest of us. And if you're worried that God's going to prove himself to be faithful, that maybe he's not going to show up, like he says in Psalm 37, 4, that he'll give you the desires of your heart. Let me give you two examples this morning of when obedience to God's commands led to abundance, okay? The very first one is in Genesis 22. I want you to turn there, okay? Genesis 22, and if you grew up in church, you'd known this story. And full disclaimer, if you're new to church, this story will be a little weird, okay? A little weird. So Genesis chapter 22, Genesis in the front of the Bible, verse 1. It's going to be on the screen if you don't have your word today, but I do love hearing all the papers rustling, man. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early the next morning, saddled the donkey, and took two of the young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place that God had told him. Verse 4. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw a place from afar. And when Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey, I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took it in his hand, the fire and the knife. So they went, both of them, together. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father, he said, here I am, my son. He said, behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Isaac's catching on something. He's like, I got wood on my back. He's got a knife and he's got a torch, but I ain't seen no animals yet, right? And I, Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. And when they came to a place of God had told him, Abraham built the altar there, and he laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out with his hand, took a knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. He said, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing as you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And the ram went and took, and he took the ram and offered it as a burnt offering in, instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And as it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. So a little context on what's going on. Abraham, uh, was really old when the Lord comes to him and says, hey, you're going to have a kid. In fact, you're going, to have, uh, you're going to have offspring that are going to number the stars in the sky, right? Like just this astronomical pro- prophecy. His wife laughs at it, but lo and behold, they get pregnant. And so now Abraham, who is super faithful and trusting of the Lord, is enjoying dad life. He's raising a son. His son's gotten older now. Like he's capable of going with him. He's, he's, he's probably a teenager. We don't really know. And uh, 
Abraham, man, gets a call from God in the middle of the night with probably the worst possible request from God. And God says to him, you know Isaac, your son, your only son, which was not not his only son, but that's a whole different story. But he says, your only son, I want you to take him to the mountain that I'm going to point to you, and I want you to sacrifice him. Can you imagine what, the, and the word says the next morning he got up and left. Can you imagine what that night was like wrestling in his mind of like, wait, Lord, you gave me this blessing, and now I'm supposed to turn around and give it back to you? Like, what kind of promise is that, Lord? This, I didn't know this promise was on loan to you, right? And can you imagine what that was like, man? And, and we get upset when God calls us, like, to greet at the door, right, on, 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 during first service or something. Like, oh, I have to work first service. And, man, God's asking you to do that, but he asked Abraham to kill his son at a really old age that he knew was miraculous to begin with, and he knew he couldn't have another one. But God looks at Abraham and says, remember that one thing you prayed for? Yeah, that, that one promise that you wanted, I want that back. And here's my question to you this morning. Like, what do you do when, when God asks you to do something difficult? What do you do when obedience, okay, means giving up something that you cherish? Now, if you know anything about the Lord, he doesn't call for child sacrifice, except in this one moment, Right? And he doesn't fulfill it because the Lord is a protector of life. But if you look at this story, a couple things stand out to me. Number one, his level of faith, right? His level of faith, but man, his willingness to be obedient. And no one ever said that obedience was going to be easy, okay? If it was easy, right, more people would do it. If it was easy, more people would obey. In fact, I want you to write this down. If you're willing, okay, to do the hard things, you get to experience what the unwilling only hope for. And that, that, let me tell you something, that applies to life and achievement, right? But that also applies to your spiritual walk with the Lord, man. If you want to see God move big, if you want to see God answer big prayers, you got to pray big prayers, right? If you want to see God, I found the more I found out about the Lord, it's found in surrender. I've got to give more to him, give more of myself and more of my heart to him. But man, what do you do? when God asks for something that you hold dear, okay? And, and he's not asking for your child, but he is asking for your security. God is asking for something that you cherish called your comfortability. He is asking for your time. He is asking for your talent. He is asking for your treasure. He is asking for your heart. He's asking for something that's, that you cherish. And so what are you doing in this limbo of, you know what God's asking you to do, but yet you still hold on to it, unwilling to give to him? And I love what he says, man. He says it with such bold faith. The Lord will provide a lamb for the sacrifice, man. He's such a man of faith. Talk about faith. Abraham had faith that, that God would provide. Even if that meant God taking Isaac, he had faith that God would still hold true to the promise he made before Isaac that he would be the father of many nations. That's trust. you got to trust that if God, if God helped you back then, God will still be true today. God still will show up today. And what does God do, man? God provides a ram. That's the best part about it. Every step that Abraham took, right, up that mountain of faith, in that walk of obedience, he had no clue that on the other side, for every step he took, God was walking up provision on the other side because God is the God of the other side, not just the one that you're on. He's hills and valleys. He's, he's top and bottom. He's through the whole way. And I don't know who needs to hear this today, but you're wondering if God's going to provide for you if you take that step of faith. You're wondering if you obey and be bold if God's going to show up. This story is proof that if you walk that step of faith, God will walk provision up the other side and you'll never meet it hear me you'll never meet provision if you stop short I find that people who don't believe that God is a provider are people who stop short of what he's asking them to do they stop short of giving they stop short of getting involved they stop short of giving him their whole heart and their whole soul and their whole mind but that's not even like the best part of the story, okay? Let me, let, let's keep reading just 15 uh, through 18, okay? And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you. I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of the heaven and the sand that is on the seashore, and your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. And look at verse 18. 
And in your offspring shall, be all, shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Because you have obeyed my voice. Let me share something with you. I, I get this a lot. How, I, I need to hear from the Lord. I got to talk from the Lord. How do I know how to hear from the Lord? You won't be able to recognize his voice if you don't hear what he's already been saying for generations. And he says it right here in this word. Why is this a church that's built on the word? Because God's trying to send you on a path of discovery of him, to learn more about him, to learn more about the plan that he has for your life, the guardrails, the blessings, the favor, and the future that lies ahead of you. And you're not going to be able to recognize the voice of the Lord if you don't hear it the very first time in his word. John 10, 27, it says that my sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me, right? Look at how that is. The sheep, they hear my voice. I know them, they know me, and they follow me. Notice it doesn't say that the sheep weigh in, they give their thoughts, we come to a comfortable conclusion, and we decide a path together on which way to go. No, it says, I tell the sheep where to go, the sheep hear my voice, and they follow me. They follow me. They chase after me. Because you have obeyed my voice is what he tells Abraham. I'm going to bless you. Look at that. So richly, generations, like sand on the seashore kind of expanse of generations. And then he says, I'll bless all nations through you. And he was talking about Jesus. I'm going to, I, you have obeyed me to such a tear that I'm going to send my one path of redemption through your lineage. And I'm going to bless you. And people will be blessed. People were blessed because of a moment that he said yes to the call of God on his life. God was so impressed with Abraham that he didn't withhold his only son because God knew one day he was going to have to freely give up his own son so that you and I could have life. And here's here's the thought I've got for you, okay? I want you to write it down. What sacrifices of obedience is God asking you to do that you've given up on? Okay, what what sacrifice of obedience? What is that, that lump in your throat right now? That one thing you know you're supposed to drop, you're supposed to walk away. Maybe, man, maybe it was a calling that you stepped away from. Maybe it's something you've been bound to addictively. Maybe it's a person. Maybe it's a thought process. Maybe it's fear and you just, God's shown you a way out of it, but you just can't seem to walk away from it. You just keep holding on to anxiety and fear. And what is God asking you to sacrifice that you've already kind of given up on? Here's the second story, okay? Luke chapter 5. Jump with me to Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5, I want to read verses 1 through 11. This is kind of uh, the beginning of Jesus' story. If you're with me, say I'm with you. Come on. It's kind of the beginning of Jesus' ministry, right? He's calling all of his disciples, and uh, this is a really great story. Let's pick up in verse 1. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. And he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked them to put out a little bit from the land. And he sat down and he taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let your nets down for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, okay, we have toiled all night and we took nothing. But at your word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed such a large number of fish that their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come help them. And when they had filled both the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees and said, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken in. And so also were, the, were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, And were the partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid, for now on you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to the land, they left everything. Look at that. They left everything and they followed him. They dropped a career in a moment and they just followed him. And I'm going to close just with this thought, so I'll invite the team to come back up. But like Simon, who, who, right, is later named just Peter, right? He is the rock in which the Lord builds the church on. He has no problem in this moment when Jesus borrows the boat to kind of slide out away from the crowd. He has no problem reminding Jesus uh, that he's a fisherman and they didn't catch anything all night, right? 
Can you imagine what was going through his mind, right? Like, I appreciate you, Rabbi, but this is what I do for a living, right? And uh, we worked all night, and we didn't catch anything, okay? We worked all night, and we didn't catch anything. And I don't think tossing the net on the other side of this boat right now is going to matter, but I'm going to do it anyways, I guess. Like, you get the sense of this tension. And there's this, there are times, hear me, I really believe this as a pastor, there are times where I believe our expertise and our knowledge gets in the way of us seeing the Lord move in a mighty way. Because we've got to explain it all. We've got to explain it all. We've got to know it all. I, I grew up, uh, my grandparents helped raise me because my parents worked really hard to provide for our family. And uh, my grandma would often say to me, uh, right, uh, boy, she, she would say, boy, you're too smart for your own good. Right? Now, as a child, I thought that was a compliment. Right? But as an adult, I realized she was telling me that I am smart aleck, right? <laughs> to put it kindly. I'm like, you smart aleck, son. You fixing to find out, right? My, my mima believed in soap on the mouth. Y'all know what I'm talking about? God, you say a bad word in that house, you was getting the dial soap. <laughs> and uh, I really believe this, that sometimes we can be so good at what we do. And we can serve the Lord for so long and be so, we can know the word so much that when he asks us to do something simple, like throw the net on the other side, we try to remind him that we know what we're doing. And I often wonder what would happen to Peter and the sons of Zebedee if they would have just ignored the Lord and never threw that net on the other side of that boat, right? This story, right, these guys are career fishermen, they tried all the things that career fishermen do, and they weren't successful. And here comes this teacher who says, hey, I got an idea. Why don't you just toss your boat on the other side? Like, yeah, right. We've not tried that before, Lord. Right? And yet, when they throw it on the other side, they draw in such a catch that both boats almost sink. Right? And I want, I want you to know this. Write it down. If you want to achieve something bigger than yourself, it starts by obeying, the God, obeying God in the very simple steps. You want to achieve something great? Guess what? Congratulations. Start praying, right? Just pray. Maybe you should start with reading the Word and with our worship. I mean, I found that, that God, He's calling us to not super complex things. He's just calling us to simple devotion of what someone who loves the Lord would do. Pray. Read the Word daily. Ask, man, ask the Lord. Man, I find a lot of people don't ask the Lord with the pure intention. And when God shows you, man, God's shown me a lot of dreams for, for, for our, my family and for our life. And God shows you the big picture, right? He shows you what the end result is. But the big picture is not built in that moment. In fact, big picture dreams, they're built on daily decisions. Day in, day out, you work towards the goal, day in and day out. And that's, I think that's one thing that frustrates culture, right, is that we've got this desire for like a speed dating microwave kind of response, but yet Lord is pulling out the crock pot and the slow cooker, and he's just hanging out for a while. And I don't think it's just our expertise too, man. I, I really think it's our failure that gets in the way of us seeing God move again in our life. And as someone who's, in the room and you've tried something. Maybe God called you to do something. You, try, you tried to step into ministry. Maybe you tried just to be a witness to somebody at, at work and man, it did not go well. It kind of fell like a plane, just crashed hard. And you just got this tension in your heart about obeying the Lord one more time because it didn't work out the first time. Just because God's asking you to do something that you have already failed at doesn't mean that you're gonna fail again. I mean, look at Peter, okay? He falls down on his knees before the Lord in this moment and says, I am a man full of iniquity. I am not holy like you. And the Lord says, I'm going to make you a fisherman. And he becomes this mighty hand of God. And then he denies Jesus three times in Jesus' greatest moment of need. And guess what? He goes back to fishing again. And the Lord does this same miracle all over again. And in the middle of the night, and maybe that's the miracle, right? Maybe this is the miracle. Not that Peter and the sons of Zebedee said yes and cast a net and caught a bunch of fish. Maybe the miracle is this. Jesus knew he would bump into them on the shore. And so he kept the fish away all night just to get their attention, just to put them in a position where they would respond to a simple command and realize it was truly a supernatural response from the Lord. 
Could it be that God's just asking you to try one more time? Could it be that God's looking at you one more time saying, trust me, just one more time. Be bold for me just one more time. Just pick that dream up one more time. And if you'll just walk towards what I've got for you, I promise that I'll be a provider. Because if you do, man, God will do what he did for the disciples. He'll show you what he has in store for you all along. What was just another morning after a failed night of fishing turns out to be the beginning of an incredible journey for a group of men who would watch the Son of God come down to this earth, give, their, give his life. They'd watch miracles happen, and Peter would one day build the church. He would one day launch this whole thing for the Lord. In their obedience to his simple task, it set them on this course change that they never could have dreamed of. And I feel like for somebody today, that's what the Lord's trying to tell you if you'll just... Be obedient to the simple thing he's asking you to do. There will be a course change in your family generationally. Never underestimate the power of obedience to God. Never underestimate the power of obedience. Man, there's one thing I'm learning about this journey as a pastor, and this journey as a dad. I feel like in a lot, of, a lot of big moments in my life, I've consulted the Lord and had clarity and it felt good. But man, I need him more in my day to day now than I ever have in my entire life. I mean, there's sometimes I've got to type an email and i got to pray first, right? Like, I'm like, all right, Lord, I need a touch right here. I need you to keep the flesh at bay, right? You need the Lord more and more. And man, when you, I can tell you this, I can stand witness to you that if you obey the Lord, man, he'll bless you. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. When we obey, God blesses. And when he blesses our obedience, it points back to his goodness and grace. Obedience is how you open the door to favor. Maybe you need that in your life. Obedience is how you open the door to favor. Obedience is how you open the door to what's next in your life, to your future. And here's my last question for you. What is is God asking you to persist in doing that you've already quit on? I feel the Lord called me to get some quitters out of the depths of despair today. God is not done with you. If he was done with you, he would have taken you. God's not done with you. And sure, you might have made a mistake, but let me tell you what, join the party in this room, buddy. Join the party on this platform. We all make mistakes. And that's the best part about grace is, man, God is a God of a billion chances, I feel like, right? And, and, and right, like the, the old song says, a saint is just a sinner who fell down. Come on, but God back up, man. God back up. And I don't know what you've been battling with with the Lord lately. I don't know what you're holding on to that he's telling you to release. But if you'll just release it today, you'll find freedom and you'll find restoration. Would you stand with me today? Hey, family, I hope that word blessed you. In fact, I believe that that word is touching lives right now. And maybe that's you. Maybe you feel a million miles away from Christ, but you know right now you need to make a decision to give your heart to him. I would love to give you that opportunity right now In fact, if that's you, I would love for you to pray this prayer with me. Say, Dear Jesus, I realize I'm a sinner and that I need a Savior. Come into my heart, forgive me of my sins, and make me whole. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, if that's you and you made that decision, we'd love to hear from you. And maybe you've got some other prayer requests or needs that you'd like for us to pray for. I'd love for you to use the email link listed below and let us know what's on your mind. Thanks for coming out and listening to today's message, and we'd love to see you back later next week.